Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. It is that time again. Thank you for joining me. I'm going to be doing a podcast on a movie called Pale Rider. This is another western that I love. Came out in 1985, directed by Clint Eastwood. Also starring in the leading role. Another tour de force of his talent. I like this maybe a little more than Unforgiven, although I think Unforgiven is a better better suited for, you know, it's a different story. This is more going back to a little more action and a little more um, mystery. I don't give too much away with plot and storyline, but these are older. These are, you know, westerns, so most people don't give a shit. But in theory, you don't know if he's a real person who survived something and is coming back or is a ghost. And he's done this once before. I believe it was... Um, what movie was it that he did? Wow. High Plains Drifter. That's what it was. Where it's... It gives you... It's another great movie. It gives you flashbacks of... Uh, town idiots or whatever. Killing a guy. Bull whipping him to death. And then his spirit comes back in the form of Clint Eastwood. And takes revenge on the town type thing. This one, it starts, and it's done so good. Especially for me, who, I'm not a religious person, but the religious tones on this just match perfect. So you have this town. It's getting r uh, run over by some, uh, you know, coal mine miner guy. Played by, um, God, what was his name? He's a great guy, a great actor. Uh... Shit, I should prepare for these things. But he's got his men and whatever, and they go and they ride through this town trying to scare everybody off to kill this little girl's dog. And she prays, um, the fuck it was, like Psalms something. And all of a sudden, Clint Eastwood's horse starts coming out of the, uh, um, you know, comes out of nowhere. And the town's trying to recover, and they're trying to decide if they're going to leave or stay. It's one of those type of movies. So as she's talking to her mother, because she, uh, she has like a stepfather, um, and uh, she's reading from the Bible, and as she gets to the passage of uh, Revelations or uh, whatever the fuck that is, uh, uh, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And then Clint Eastwood comes into frame outside her window. And she takes note of it. He's on a pale horse. And it just gives you chills. It so sets the mood, the music. It, oh, and then sat on him was Death and Hell followed with him. That's the end of the passage. And it just sets up the movie so well. There's a little bit of a twist where the wife's like, um... Oh, so while this is, the girl did, buries her dog, she prays, and the stepfather or whatever goes into town to get stuff, and he gets beaten up on, and there's a classic scene where uh, they're hitting him with various things and um, axe handles, so he grabs one, twists it around, he, starts, he beats the shit out of all of them, saves the guy, and he just goes about his business, and the guy catches up to him. And says, oh, you know, why don't you stay at my house? Then, um, I think it was Michael Moriarty, was the husband's name. Hmm. Then, uh, oh, Chris Penn played the son. I think Richard Dysart is, uh, the main villain. But there's a whole cast of characters, and then the special sheriff comes. So anyway, he goes in town, he helps him, he saves him, but he doesn't really 
look like he wants anything to do with him, but the guy says, look, you helped me, look, you could stay, I got a room, you could, you know, at least I could do a thank you. So when he comes home and the wife's like, you ain't bringing no rowdy guy in here, oh, but he saved me, and then he walks in, and he's got a clerical collar on, and from then on, he's called Preacher, and it fucking is awesome. The tones in it are just fabulous. He comes in, helping out the town, showing them hard work and do this, and he'll bring in a couple of uh, sage uh, Bible quotes, but done in his own way. Um, and I think he's just fabulous at this point in his career, he's just on on point. I go back and I love his older ones. I mean. Fistful of Dollars for a Few Dollars More, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, I think it's called like the Nameless Trilogy, where he has the same, I think it's a snake monogram on his, or emblem on his guns, going back to his Rawhide days or something like that. I love them, and I love the ones in between, even the two mules with Sister Sarah, which is a little wacky, but is this a great movie? This is the his prime in this area. This is why I think he decided after this, I think it was The Unforgiven came after, which is such a riveting story. This is more, you know, just in a different vein, but it's something I think I watch more than The Unforgiven. I watch this because of the themes more and the way they're set up, the way it's paced and edited, where when you watch The Unforgiven, you know, your heart's just, you know, it's a different vibe, a different feel. But this one, the tones were just so great. And then the stepfather or husband guy who brings him in notices he has uh, six, looks like six bullet wound scars in his back. Clint Eastwood does. So that's where you get this, Is you know, is he uh, come back as God works in mysterious ways type thing and he comes back to settle a debt or did he survive what these people did to him and the people I'm talking about are the uh, the rich guy who's trying to buy everything up trying to get these people out of their land I think it's Richard Dysart um, they hire uh, Stockholm uh, Marshall Stockholm Stockburn that's it Stockburn uh, and he comes with his crew it's like six deputies or five deputies and it's just insane. They come in, and meanwhile, the, the town is doing hard, you know, it's a hardship town. It's mud and slug everywhere. They're trying to get by. Cold winters, not enough food. The guy in the town, the general stores, like they all owe him money. And there's like a cool speech here and there about why they're staying there, why they want to fight for their land, why they believe it's right. And there is a point where they are deciding to leave Clint Eastwood um, the first the second time he goes back or the first time for them he says hey why not go into town because he found some gold and uh, uh, La Hood I think that his fucking name is like the villains of La Hood his men come out and say he wants to talk to you so he goes over and talks to them while the uh, wife and daughter and the uh, the wagon and the guys in the shop and he talks to them and it's a really great scene the rich guy wants to get this preacher on his side offers to get him a church buy him the clothes and in a way he says you know you can't serve um the people and god or to some effect he uses a word um it's like mammon something like that right he uses some crazy word you can't serve God and Maman. Maman being money, I guess. I think it's supposed to have something to do with like Paul the Apostle. Anyway, th those elements are great in the movie. Now, I am not a fan of religion. I hate it. I wish he was not here no more to some to most effect. But what it's good for him, what it was good for in the past, can be used. And this is done amazingly. It's not overdone beating you over the head but he's just witty he's got smarts about him and then it comes to the point where this town got this guy 
he sends out for Stockburn and his men. And then they come back, they, you know, they go into town to meet the guy. There's another ancillary character who finds gold, goes into town, they gun him down. And then Cleese would know it's time. Goes into town, goes to get a, I guess, a, a box from the, um, the bank, you know, you put your money in the bank. And then he opens it, he takes his collar off and puts it in, he grabs the fucking gun belt, puts the gun on, comes in, and you can tell there's a, he knows who this sheriff is and that these are the people who gunned him down, either killed him and he came back, or it's the mystery of did he survive and then came back. So he confronts him at the end, it's fucking epic gun battle, just done well, the pieces of this movie come together in, in an awesome way, there's still undertones of the girl, she's like real young, and she's falling in love with Clint Eastwood, and he's like, you know, you'll find somebody, and she, she's heartbroken, it's just, it's just so many good elements of it, you know, showing the sides of these towns back in the day, I think uh, Deadwood did a great, an awesome job of it, to show what it was like, you know, you're trying to, you know, kick up a town and this rich guy is you know famous for keeping it up and growing it but this people who have the land they just don't want to get off they don't want to um lose their homes and they talk about it like i said because when Clint Eastwood has to talk with him he offers the money and he says like 25 dollars a lot or something and Clint Eastwood's like all right how about a thousand dollars or something weird and the guy's like all right, you know what? You give him that offer. You tell him I want them off by tomorrow. Meaning he gave it to Clint Eastwood's like a little bit more than expected money. Because that's what it felt like in the exchange. Because, you know, the money fucking system back then. I don't know what the fuck things were worth. So, I don't know. Something like, you know, I'll give him $50 or $25 a plot. And he says, oh, how about 200 or whatever it was. He finally agrees to it and says, you tell him to get So, he goes back and he tells him, look. You can take the offer. There'll be no problems. And they're trying to debate whether, oh, we have enough men. You know, we got enough guys. We can hold rifles. We could hold off. And Clint was trying to describe to them how bad this guy Stockburn is. And it gives you that connection that Clint Eastwood must have had dealings with this group. And they shot him in the back six times or whatever the fuck. And it has a great climax. Everything just fits in the western genre he hits every point he's just so good at, at this point in his life is it seems like there's no effort that he's he's there like the, even the whole cast by the way this is not just um it's just his big name that i recognize you know but you know some of these actors from other movies and i think richard drysat or uh, dysat is the dysart is the um one of the scientists in the thing, Chris Penn, we know. Um, Michael Moriarty, you'll see him in everything. You just might not recognize his face. He looks like a John Lithgow type guy, I guess. But it's just the whole cast works well. The woman, uh, Carrie Snogris, is a great actress. Everything just works well. You know, all the pieces come together. At the time, I think it was one of the highest grossing westerns of the 80s. It just has excellence written on it. And sometimes I could see, if I want to be a critic, I could say The Unforgiven is a better movie. But it doesn't mean it's more watchable. Like the impact is there in, in Unforgiven. But the sections in between don't build up like this does for rewatchability. For me, rewatching this, I find little things. And although I've done that in Unforgiven, but this is just. I don't know, it's just a more fulfilling experience all around rather than the unforgiven which tone is, you know, guy's lost almost everything, he sees an opportunity to make money but he has to go back to his old ways and then once he goes back, fucking shit hits the fan and in a way that just gives you chills and those amazing movies. but. I'm a big Western fan. I grew up jumping on the couch with my toy guns, and my uncle had a uh, BB gun. It was like a little rifle. It was like a Winchester, and I would make believe. 
that it was, um, you know, real gun. I play Cowboys and Indians. Just a big part of growing up. And this is right in my wheelhouse. I'm, what, 14, 15, this movie comes out. Just blows me away. I'm a big fan already. Watching all the old stuff, catching up. And like I said in some podcasts that um, I've watched everything, even though I might not go back and tout some of those movies, but John Wayne, all the big westerns. Was, actually, they weren't even westerns. They were just stars who were just doing westerns back then. And some are great. Some are really good. New TV shows. But this is the top three in my Clint Eastwood grouping I'm going to go Outlaw Josie Wales, Pale Rider, Unforgiven, and then you just fill in everything else. He's just that amazing in this genre, and most of his career, he does everything amazingly, but to me, this is the, the, the high mark. Anyway, I hope everybody's doing well. Stay safe out there. My best to you and yours. Bye-bye.